up stories for life. <laughs> Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the first time storytelling broadcast. It's been I was trying to figure out exactly how long it's been. It's definitely been over a year. And I actually can't remember why I stopped doing the first time storytelling broadcast. We hit 100 episode and I just, I just stopped. So we are picking it back up because I have some, some big plans, big mission to accomplish and achieve with first time uh, storytelling. And I think the first time storytelling broadcast is such a beautiful way of bringing guests to you to share their first time stories so that you experience the power of first time storytelling. Now, uh, our, our guests coming back on um, is actually, it's pretty, it's actually kind of cool because before I introduce him, I'm gonna give you a little bit backstory of how I met him. So I met him, it's almost been a month because Tech Alley is on Saturday. Oh yeah. I, yeah so <laughs> I feel like it's already been longer than that, that, that I've known you. But so I met Ronnie uh, about a month ago at Tech Alley in Las Vegas. So Ronnie is also here in, in Las Vegas. And this crazy thing happened when we met is first thing I did was tell him some stories because I was inviting him and uh, this guy, Chris, to the first time story slam. And Ronnie showed up at the first time story slam and the happy hour that we had before that. And we got into uh, storytelling. I got to hear some of his stories. He took to the stage at the first time story slam, told a really great story. And he also happens to also be a former Marine. And so he describes himself as just a dude with a lot of weird stories. So I, I think that that is probably a true, true fact about him based on some of the stories that I've already heard, because he's the kind of guy that when somebody says, hey, let's do this, he says yes. And that's a person, you know, after my own heart, and that leads to having a lot of ventures and meeting all kinds of people and ending up with tons of stories. So Ronnie, whose full name is Ronald Long, is here to share the story of his first time in Romania. Now, there's a twist to the story because it happened to be an emergency stop on his way to his first tour in Afghanistan. So Ronnie, welcome and thank you for being my first guest back on the first time storytelling at broadcast. No, oh, well, thank you for having me. That was pretty, I just realized Chris never showed up to that story slam. <laughs> <laughs> I just realized it now. I was like, well, he never showed up. He did have a date with Jamie afterwards though. <laughs> That's why she left early. <laughs> She, show, she showed up though. She did show up. Yes, indeed. Um, uh, yeah, hopefully I'll be having her on the broadcast as well because she's somebody else who is really embracing the first mm -hmm. time uh, storytelling. So, all right, Ronnie. So let's let's set this up, right? Okay. So give us a little bit of the backstory and and we let's we're looking forward to your story. All right. So I was uh, I was a brand new Marine at the time. Uh, I should give you a little context before that. It, this was 2010 when we were traveling to Sangin, Afghanistan. But before that, um, I went pretty much from boot camp straight to combat training. And then because of some logistical issues, I went straight to comm school. So I'd like never had a break to come home. Now, being in this comm school in particular was very special, I should say, because in the middle of the entire thing, this lady comes in and she comes into our class and asks, well, she tells us that 3rd Battalion, 5th Marines, everyone knows who they are. They're the Marines that lifted the flag on Iwo Jima and everything. They were going to Afghanistan in a couple months and they didn't have radio operators who were staying in for that period of time where they had some, but not enough for the deployment that they were going. So they were looking for people who were willing to volunteer and go almost immediately to Afghanistan. So pretty much like right when we got out of comp school, we'd be going to Mojave Viper with 3-5, and then we would be shipping off. So I figured since everything was already going that way and no one else was raising their hands, I decided to raise my hand to go to 3-5 to go to Afghanistan with these guys. And after I did, like 14 other people in the class decided to as well. So I guess it was just, I, I'm a bad influence on everybody. So I apologize. But when I finally got to 3-5, we, we got done with the Mojave Viper training. We started going into the 
getting ready to leave. And we started going through the process of transport, getting over there. So it's the first time I saw the East Coast. So I got to see Maine for like two seconds from the airport. And then we flew over. And then while we were going, you know, you can kind of tell a lot of people here were, they were getting kind of nervous because we were going into Afghanistan. It was a combat deployment. And in this case, most of my leadership, besides a handful of them, have only been on a um, Marine Expeditionary Unit, a MU, which means they've never been to combat. They've been on boats and traveling and doing training exercise and doing all these things. So it was a very big majority of these. My leadership was not combat hardened yet, if I can say that. There was a few of us. Um, Sergeant Peel was, he went to Fallujah and then he's only been to combat deployment. So he was definitely a, a very wise leader in that case. He's never been on a MU. Uh, but my direct leadership sometimes was a little bit on the inexperienced side, I should say. So we get to Europe finally, and we end up having to land. And when we were in the airport, it, we actually had to leave the plane, which was straight. We, we get, we sometimes you have to trade planes to get to different areas, but we had to leave the plane and we sat into a terminal that was completely blocked off. So wherever it was, it was, it was very evident that it was blocked off. So we are isolated from whatever else we were at. We had no idea where we were at this time. So if you can imagine, it was obviously an airport terminal, but you couldn't see out the windows, you couldn't see out the doors, you couldn't see people, even though you can hear them. And we were there for hours. I mean, several hours, we're all sitting there full gear, had our packs, our rifles, everything, and we're sitting there. And Marines are just Marines. We, we make the best of whatever we can. Some people have cards, so we play some spades. Um, cell phones weren't really that advanced as they were today. So, I mean, it was 2010. They were advanced, but they weren't advanced, all right? We were just above the snake, you know, the snake game. We were just above that. But, you know, they had little games that were coming up. So we, we were doing this, this one that was popular was uh, there was a phone app where you took a picture and it put someone in sniper reticles. It was like foreshadowing before foreshadowing happened. But, you know, we were kind of just shooting the shit. I didn't know most of the people here. I was still attached to the HNS, which is headquarters and support element. So I got to meet a little bit of everyone from Kilo Company, from uh, Lima Company, India Company. I, I mean, I got to meet a little bit of everyone. They attached me to HNS with India, but we were all in the same general spot. And so we were just here waiting. And I remember when we started to realize something was a little bit wrong was about four or five hours in of waiting at this airport. And you start hearing, you, are, you start hearing like these footsteps coming down the line and it was like a movie almost. It was obviously high heels. So we start hearing it and we see this woman come, come across. And it was like, it was like the first time we seen an Eastern European woman. Like you can obviously tell that she was, she knew she looked really good and she was in front of all the Marines and we saw, we were like, she's making a show for some reason. She's going somewhere and she gets her crossed. She talks to um, one of the people who were in charge of us and, oh yeah, Captain. So he comes over and he tells all of us that the pilot has something wrong and we need to stay in Romania for an undetermined amount of time. So they organized something where we would be staying out in the town. This was, a, this was gonna be really interesting because all of a sudden they opened up the, the walls and we're in the airport inside Romania. Don't ask me what part of Romania, even if I could read it, I couldn't pronounce the word for you guys, but we were there and it was obviously not America, it was obviously not in a normal place in Europe, but this was an interesting thing to see. Uh, I saw, first thing I saw was Vlad the Impaler on a freaking dinner plate. And I was like, I think we might be in Romania because I know who this guy is. <laughs> this is Vlad the Impaler, the guy who they based Dracula on. I mean, I got a I got Dracula right here on the cup. So it's like, and just deal, talking to the people there, they were such a different culture. We're, we're Marines, we're American Marines 
full gear. I'm talking full Marine Corps outfit. We have our weapons. We have all our stuff. We have all our gear. And you see there's a very big contrast on the loudness of what we are and who they are. So there was different uh, what modes of transportation that were going to where we were staying. They didn't tell us where we were staying. They just said we were staying in a hotel. So apparently they rented out an entire hotel in some unknown part of this, uh, this city. So we get out and I see buses and everything else going. So a lot of the guys are loading up in buses, but I didn't get on a bus. No, I got attached with our company commander, Captain Isra, uh, Isra, and let's see, our first sergeant and a couple other people. It was like six other people and me, and we're going into the sketchiest van you can imagine at this point in time. It's just, you see the buses and all the other guys are going on these buses. And then you see the van. And for some reason, private, I wasn't even a PFC, private long, is going with them because I'm part of h &S. So we get to this van and they open up the side of the van. First thing I see is the driver through it. And if you can imagine 80s punk, that's what this guy looked like. I'm talking about skinny. He had the tight freaking like a wife beater on, right? The baggy pants. He had obviously blonde hair, but it was like buzzed down really short. It, he looked like it was kind of like Mad Max kind of thing going on. He was my driver and he didn't speak a word of English, but he was already pumped, bobbing his head like he was listening to music, which there was no music, by the way. I should say that there was no music, but he was excited to have us in his car and get everything going. So we get all that stuff loaded up, up and down that and I get inside and I realize that there's a TV screen up on the top. And I realized like the guy who's driving kind of looks like the person that's on the screen there. And that guy's on, a, he's on a stage. And I'm thinking, I was like, I have a feeling this is going to get, this is going to be interesting because he has, it looks like him, <laughs> but I don't know if it's him. I just, he might just be a really uber big fan, but whatever. So we shut the door. He starts up the van and this is my first experience with really loud European techno music. He was, this guy was performing some loud techno European stuff, music, and he had the biggest speakers that I couldn't see because it was like midnight at the time. And this guy flies. I'm talking flying on the road, like he's hitting corners hard. He's driving freaking fast. And I'm looking out the window because there's windows in this van. It's sketchy, but it still has van windows on the side. And if you've seen the movie Hostel, it kind of reminded me of the movie Hostel, where it's luscious and green in some areas. And then you hit like random, just random buildings that were kind of messed up in some way, where weird way, either they were just aged or just damaged because of the weather and all that. And then you'd see random Mercedes-Benz dealerships, just pristine condition over there. And I was completely confused. But we're going on like 120 miles an hour on a windy ass road. I don't see any buses. I don't see any other cars. This guy's flying and he's singing. Don't forget, he's singing too. It was kind of feeling like that Willy Wonka scene when they're on the freaking boat and they're going through the cave and everyone's freaking out because no one knows what's going on, but the driver knows what's up. And that's how this felt. I had no idea where we were going, what was happening. And we, it, felt like, it felt like 30 to 40 minutes, maybe. I have no idea how long we were driving. I just remember hitting every single side and every turn and feeling it in my body. And finally, we, we get to this hard turn around these bushes, like uh, all this shrubbery and plants and all this. And you see a Ramada Inn, which was not what I was expecting in the middle of uh, wherever we were. They finally told us it was Romania, but it was a Ramada Inn in the middle of nowhere, just right here. And apparently we rented the whole thing out because we had an entire unit to come into this, uh, this, this place. So they bring us out to the lobby. We look around and it's a beautiful hotel considering, you know, I've been to Ramada, Ramada hotels in different places in America. They usually aren't as nice unless they're in the bigger cities, but this one was really nice. And at this time, I've never traveled outside of America. I've never traveled to different places. And, and yeah, I mean, I, to this day, I've still never been on a vacation. So I, I didn't understand the necessity of understanding how to talk to people 
people who are there or the benefit of using a concierge service or even understanding how things work. So we just kind of let them do their thing and then they would communicate with us. Well, dude comes back, he has all these room keys and he assigns us all these rooms. Now, one of the guys who went with me to comm school was Lewis. He was my roommate. He's this tall, six foot, five black dude from Mississippi, right? And then you got me from freaking California. We're very different, but we got along. We ended up having, we being roommates in Romania. <laughs> so we get the room, we find our room, we get in. And Europe is different from America. And this is why I should say this. We get to the room and we could not figure out why there was no power in the room whatsoever. Now they told us that there was some, like not my commanding, but the room, the people who worked there, they were telling us how to turn the power on, but it wasn't in a way I can understand. So I, I didn't realize that, that, that they were communicating to us to tell us how to do it. So me and Lewis spent the next two hours trying to figure out how to turn power on into this room. It was just dark, right? The only thing that really worked was this emergency light that's over the door <laughs> by the front. And gosh, we had no idea what we were freaking doing. Uh, finally, I realized by the door, there's actually a key slot for the key card. And I was like, I wonder, so I look at the goose. So I was like, well, I'm not locked into my room. So this key must be for something. So I put the key card in the wall. All of a sudden, every freaking light in the room turns on. Two hours later, me and Mississippi over here are just like, man, this is the, we felt like the dumbest motherfuckers in the entire world because we couldn't figure it out. But of course, we hear people on the outside. We hear all the people having fun out in the hotel. Now, they weren't having fun like in the normal Marine Corps sense, but they were just kind of, it was kind of a relief. You got to understand like at this point, the travel going to Afghanistan was very stressful. We have our weapons still, we have all our things, we have all our, we, we know where we're going. And so that stress build up every time we were flying somewhere, every time we were going somewhere, we did kind of make short stops every once in a while, but we never really got out of the plane, like out of the airport, out of the terminal or anything like that. We kind of just stayed where we were going and we're mentally preparing ourselves to go. So having this break, hearing that we're staying at a hotel at some random hotel was kind of a psychological relief for just a split second, like a breath that you can take when you're trying to, when you're trying to swim. So if we're having a good time that I know a couple people ordered like Domino's pizza and it came back really weird because apparently they don't put sauce in that part of Europe. They put it on the side. So everything is just baked on the bread. It was very confusing for some people. Other people were doing other things. I won't mention that, but they were, um, it was, they were enjoying the time that they had before we were going. Some of the people there were combat veterans beforehand. And I said that that was a very small handful. And I feel like a lot of those guys were encouraging the guys to enjoy as much time as possible while we were there because they knew what kind of things we were gonna walk into. And a lot of the other people, they were completely oblivious to it. And that was pretty evident by the way that uh, they were just kind of letting loose and relaxing for a minute, right? Enjoying the rooms. Uh, that was the first time I ever heard of Lady Gaga, by the way. I didn't know who that was. I turned on the TV. I was like, man, Europeans music is freaking weird. I didn't realize she was American. I've learned that very well when I came back to America. But, um, you know, we got to all these points and I remember the next morning, the next morning we get up, they had this whole uh, breakfast, buffet thing going on downstairs my first time eating European breakfast which includes fish usually which is a very strange thing but I uh I went downstairs and me and Lewis went over there and I remember I saw a friend of mine I won't bring his name up here because he ended up becoming a triple amputee later on and I don't I want to respect his privacy but he was a friend of mine a very good friend of mine uh, one of the first ones I made when I got to the unit and you know he was he was having a good time we're hanging out in the breakfast buffet me Lewis him a couple other people and man that dude was crushing on one of the waitresses so freaking hard like he was like I'm gonna get her number and I was like she doesn't speak English like at all and I don't even think she realizes that you're he's like I have a plan I was like okay what's your plan he was like, I'm going to keep getting juice 
from her since she works at the juice bar. I was like, that's your plan? You got to talk to her? He's like, no, I'm just going to let her know with mental cognizance, she's going to know that I'm attracted because I keep going over to get juice. I was like, okay, you go ahead and do that. So no joke, for the next two hours, he's going back and forth. We're still waiting to hear something back. So he's going over there, he's getting juice, trying to make eye contact and smile and be as creepy as possible because that was his prerogative, right? I'm sitting at this table and I look to my right and there's this guy in a full suit, right? Um, seemed like a friendly gentleman. And as, because I have the, especially back then, I had this problem with people's personal boundaries. I was like, hey, sir. So I, I tapped the left side. I was like, look, look at this dumbass over here. I lucked out. He spoke English. He was a German businessman from Germany. He was coming to Romania to do some work and all that. He was like looking. He was like, oh, uh, what's he doing? He thinks he can get this girl's number by getting juice from her. He's like, does that work in America? No, it doesn't work in America. So we started joking about how he's going. He's walking up. He's talking. He's sitting down. He's trying to do this. And I'm like, I keep looking and having the conversation with him. He turned out to be a very uh, friendly gentleman. He wanted to know why we were there. I was kind of explaining where we were doing. Um, it was just an interesting interaction because I've never dealt with somebody from a different country. So it was pleasantly uh, a presence place that he was able to speak my language. We were able to communicate. We were able to joke and laugh a little bit. And everyone was laughing at dude over here because he kept talking to her. And she was getting her, not harassed, I should say, but she was being picked on by all the other girls in this uh, little buffet area because they obviously knew that he was interested in her. And they kept giving her crap because she couldn't figure it out either. So there was just a lack of communication with the level of Ablo and Costello right there. So I was enjoying it. He was enjoying it. Everyone else was enjoying it. And then, <laughs> you know, we got to have this little conversation for a while. And, you know, we went back to the room. We got to hang out in the area for a while. We just, it was an interesting fellowship that we got with one another. And the reason why that was so important to the rest of it was, as I said, we went to sang in Afghanistan that year. It was 2010. We were flying in to relieve some people from 3-7. And um, it was one of the more brutal deployments since Fallujah. We lost 25 people, a few of the people I was hanging out with that night. And I think we were combat ineffective within a month and a half because of lost limbs, ID explosions, and just injuries all around. We had to get reserves coming in by the end of October because we just didn't have the people to come with us. That time we had in Romania was literally the last time any of us were untainted from combat. It was the last time many of us were in one way, shape, or another, I should say, whole. Because as much as we were able to bond in that very jovial way, when we went to Afghanistan, we bonded in a whole different way. Because even when we were over there, there are definitely some Marines who are on that deployment with me that I absolutely hate with every fiber of my being. But I'll tell you this, if someone was trying to kill him, I would make sure I would do everything I could to protect that bastard because no one else is getting that right of kicking his ass except for me, because that is still my brother because of the trauma that we ended up all going through. That deployment was one of the heaviest deployments that people have talked about. We had a huge amount of casualties, a lot of lost lives, and it kind of formed a lot of the way we think about the world. And as I was telling you, Anne, earlier, um, one of the gentlemen, from that deployment took his life on Saturday. Just thinking about that, because a lot of people did. Immediately after that deployment, some people took their life. Immediately after that deployment, some people just, they died of car accidents and things like that, just because they're out trying to cope with a lot of the things that were going through. The amount of scarring that we all went through and all the things that we ended up going through over a period of time has kind of formed who we were together. And what I learned from there over the years of thinking about that entire period of time was if it wasn't for that time that we had, 
we wouldn't have something to reflect on that was actually a positive thing in a way, some way, shape, or form. Now, I don't know what happened to that pilot because, you know, he gets on the, he gets on the thing and sells us like later on. Oh yeah, I feel a lot better now. Let, let, let's continue on. Like it was the weirdest thing in the world. But when we finally went to Afghanistan and became the people who we ended up becoming, we had something to look back for that was actually beneficial. That was actually a positive thing. And it helped me realize that no matter how dark things get, that the little things in the past that we kind of took for granted, we took a lot of those things for granted back in the day because we were kids. I don't care what anyone says about Marines, Army, and all those things when they first join and all that. Yes, you're, you're men by age, but until you go through a heavy conflict, a heavy pain, a heavy suffering, you haven't really become a man. And we really did become men after that. We, as broken and as tainted as we became, a lot of the things that we learned over that deployment was able to help us when we came to our second time around and help us in different ways as we came to this life now. There are things that I do to this day that I don't think I'd be able to cope with if it wasn't for the deployment that we went on at that point in time. Yeah. And I, I do get to appreciate a lot of the small things that happened over that period of time. I got to appreciate the people that I met over that period of time because shortly after that little deployment, I was no longer with h &S and I got attached to 3rd Platoon. And a lot of the guys here on LinkedIn who were with, who I'm added on, I mean, added with, they are from that platoon. They are from 3-5 uh, and they know what I'm talking about as how brutal that became. And if it wasn't for those people, I wouldn't be who I am today. And it all accumulated together of me understanding that the little things are really what are important. The brotherhood will always last. And I have to learn to not focus so hard on the difficulty that I'm going through now, because just like then, there are small pockets of light that I can focus on to help me get through whatever darkness I'm in today. Yeah, thank you. For, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and nothing... Nothing you're experiencing now is as bad as what you experienced mm -mm. then. And that's, you know, it, it, it's hard to remember these things. But when we do, we do realize uh, I've already overcome much more than what I'm going through now. And but the beautiful thing, too, is that your story is about remembering and having the understanding of the innocence that you all had. And that, you know, at that time in, in Romania and that that innocence, you know, got taken away by something horrific and, and violent and, and painful, but you can still, it doesn't remove the innocence that existed in the moment. So you can still go back to that innocence and retap into it and appreciate it and treasure it and, you know, share it with, with other people and really the contrast you know, mm -hmm. I'm sure if we got to some stories of what happened in Afghanistan, you know, the contrast is, is mm -hmm. insane, but it's also the contrast that you explain of, you know, we were, we were boys and then, you know, in mm -hmm. combat, you all became, you know, you all became men mm -hmm. and, you know, it was almost an overnight thing, you know, that, that happened. And, you know, there was on the way back with the same stop it could never be the same. Like it, you know, certain things can oh, never yeah. be the same, but we can always remember them. We can always, you know, tap back into it. So I really appreciate you, you sharing that, that story. That's really, it's really powerful. Yeah. And, you know, for the longest time I was wondering like, why do I want to go back to Romania? So bad? like, I always like for years, I've always wanted to this day, I still want to go back. And I really didn't understand why, because it was a crazy, it's a different country, right? I love gypsies. I have a gypsy neighbor. He's a great dude. But I think it was on a subconscious level. That was, that was definitely a time before I became as jaded as I was before. I was trying to re-grasp that in some way, yeah. shape, or form. You know, and I, I didn't really come to that conclusion until recently that I just really wanted to go back just because it was one of the last places where we were all together and everything was good. And the, so the beautiful things that you can just go back in your memory, you can, yeah. you know, yeah. And cause yeah. Um, hmm. 
great story. Okay, so one of the one of the things that I used to do on the first time storytelling broadcast that I want mm -hmm. to bring back is playing the first time lightning round. Okay. So the way that that works, it's a little similar to what we did at first time story slam. I'm going to give you ten different uh, experiences, mm -hmm. and you're it's either going to be you've done it before, so. We no longer have the 365 first challenge app, but we're still going to use the same process. So up okay. would be you've you've done it before. All right. right is you um you have never done it, would like to do it. And then left is never done it, not interested in doing it. So up you've right, done it. Left. Okay. Yeah. So okay, first one. Uh do uh calligraphy. I do it a little bit. You've done it before? Yeah, I, I wrote with a calligraphy pen about 10 minutes before we got on. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay, so what, when was your first time? What oh, was the first uh, time you did calligraphy? Actually, in Afghanistan, I started writing and my lieutenant looked at me and he was like, you write like you're tagging the side of a wall. And I was like, <laughs> I was like, I don't know. But after that, uh, I came back and I really liked writing. So I get fountain pens like this one and I practice writing every day. Because I still kind of write like cursively in a way, and um, you know, it's, I do it every day. So, just right. one of the things. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Okay, uh, second one: attend a fashion show. Ah, did I attend a fashion show? I think I did. I think I did. I want to say yes. I can't remember if it was on purpose or not. <laughs> <laughs> it's not even very memorable. Okay, uh, go deer hunting. Oh, no, I have not. I wouldn't mind though. It's just okay. camping. <laughs> so, right. So haven't done it, but would, would do it. Mm -hmm. uh, be hypnotized. Um, I don't know if I can be. I'm not that uh, wary, but if, they, if anyone can do it, go for it. Go you for it. Do... All right. So that, yeah. that's all right. Um, watch a flamingo dance show. That's the like... Spanish. Um, of like, I mean, I'll, I'll do it. I don't know what that is, but I'll do it. Yeah. <laughs> so you would go, you, would, it's, 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 it's very entertaining. Oh, yeah. Um, participate in a charity race. Oh, I've done it. Yep. Done, done it that? several times. Yep. Okay. Do you remember your first one? Uh, oh gosh. I want to say it had to do with human trafficking. I want to say it had to do with the human trafficking. Yeah, that is a very good cause to uh, to to run for. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, eat at a Michelin star restaurant. <laughs> Who has that kind of money? <laughs> <laughs> Haven't done it, but would do it. I guess yeah. if somebody else is paying. <laughs> of course, if they if they give me a freaking like hockey puck of food, I'm going to be disappointed for all four hundred dollars that I paid for. It. <laughs> so. well, at least you'd be expecting it. So, mm -hmm. all right, uh, place a bet on the horse. Oh no. No, <laughs> I'm not. I'm not. Never done that. it. Not doing not, it. Not interested. I'll watch a horse race. I ain't betting. Mm -mm. Okay. Uh, uh, do hula hoops. Oh, yeah. I do that. Then hula hoop. Mm -hmm. And the last one is go to a heavy metal concert. That's a good question. No, I've never been to a concert. So in general, in general no, like, mm -hmm. concert, no live never been a concert i've been to one live event it was the the whispers no 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 they're here in town someone invited me and i showed up for my students and and yeah I, since afghanistan i can't handle dark areas that are very loud and disorientating so it makes me get into a a very aggressive position and i don't like that about myself so gotcha, it's like gotcha yeah yeah, mm -hmm. yeah yeah and that's definitely a definition of concert especially a heavy metal concert mm -hmm. all right well that concludes the first time lightning round well i really appreciate your your time this morning your your openness your vulnerability of your story and and your support thank you oh, yeah absolutely i enjoyed it i had a good time right never told the story from beginning to end you know editing some of it <laughs> so it's all good i i enjoyed it i appreciate you having me on 
All right.